So we've got a, uh, a review today on, see, I better read that where it is. Chapters three and four. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and I'm going to share the key and we'll work from the key. I picked out several problems that I think will be uh, useful, instructive, and and uh, will help you for the upcoming exam. So here's my share. Okay. And for this review, we're gonna. Let's start off with, we just start with number one. <clears throat> All right. So number one, and this is chapter three. I'm not sure if, uh, if they restart counting. I think they do restart counting with chapter four. Yeah. When we get to chapter four, so I better identify the chapter here. Chapter three. Then one. <clears throat> okay. Naturally occurring copper exists in two isotopic forms. Uh, copper 63 and copper 65, which means uh, copper 63 has 63 called nucleons. And since uh, copper's atomic number is 29, and the remaining of those are neutrons. Oops. So the atomic mass of copper listed in the periodic table is 63.55. So that could be atomic mass units or it could be grams per mole. And remember that's a weighted average of the mass of copper for naturally occurring copper <clears throat> in the Earth's crust. So the question is, if that's the average, what's the approximate natural abundance of copper 63? Right. So uh, let's look at how the uh, atomic mass is determined, that weighted average, <clears throat> and work our way backwards. So in this case, they're using atomic mass units. All right, so we'll do that. And that value, 63.55, is the consequence of a calculation for this copper and this copper. All right, so the contribution from this one will come out here and the contribution from that one will come out here. When you add them together, you get 63.55. So if our uh, if our natural abundance of each one is a fraction, instead of percent, we make it a fraction, then we don't have to worry about multiplying. Then the contribution from this one uh, would be X. Let me get another marker. <clears throat> and the contribution from this one would be one minus X. Okay. Now, what do we multiply by X? Well, normally what you do is you use the actual atomic mass units for that isotope. But since we don't have that, we're just going to use the mass number. So this would be uh, times 63, and this would be times 65. Okay. So actually, the product of this one, and that's a fraction. Right, we'll convert it to percent later. That's a decimal fraction times this one and this one. So if you add those two together, or you do it like this, add them together, then you get 
63 X plus uh, 65 times one minus X is equal to 63.55. Okay, now we have an equation we can solve in one unknown for the X. And if we solve for X, that gives us the way we set it up. We set it up so the fraction would answer the question. What's the approximate natural abundance of 63, copper 63? <clears throat> so we just take that equation and resolve it. Just make some more room for myself. So now we're going to take this one and we've got 63 X plus 65 minus 65 X equals 63.55. Okay. So now we need to get all the unknowns on one side and all the uh, numbers on the other side. So let's just leave the X's over here and put this one over there. So this would be 63. I'm going to do two things at once. We're going to take this one and this one and factor out the X. So 63 minus 65 times X is what's left after we take this one and put it over there. 63.55 minus 65. Okay. So now this becomes minus 2x. And this becomes what? What's 63.55 and minus 65? Is minus 1.45. Okay, Oops, minus. So now if we say X is this one divided by that one, the negatives cancel and we have 72, 0.725, which is the same thing as 72.5%. Okay, so that's the natural abundance based on the data we had available. And the closest one to that in this whole list is 70%. I picked the best answer, which is C, 70%. It's actually 72.5. So it would have been better, less sneaky, if I had actually said 72.5 here as that choice. Okay, that was number one. And I'm going to keep track of the ones that I've done so I don't go back and do the same thing over again. Okay. That one took a little bit of algebra. Okay, let's see, do we need to spend some time on, yeah, three. Three is a good thought question. Really don't have to do any calculating for this one. Number three, the average mass of a carbon atom is 12.011. So what are the units for that? Doesn't have anything to do with the question, I'm just asking. What are the units? If they say the average mass of a carbon atom is 12.011, then the units of measure for that would have to be atomic mass units, because that's the way you express them for single atoms. Assuming you were able to pick up only one carbon unit, that is the atom, the chances that you would randomly get one with a mass of 12.011 is what? What's the likelihood that you would find one with that mass? Zero. 0%. It's a weighted average of two or more isotopes in this case. 
So you're not going to find one with exactly that mass, 12.011. It's kind of a trick question, but meant to make you think. Right. Let's look at number four. What's the mass of four atoms of copper in grams? Now we're going to use atomic mass in grams per mole, because that's what we need. Four atoms of copper. So if you're starting with four atoms, right, you want to end up with grams you've got to actually go through a couple of different steps, right? Because to get the grams, when you're talking about atomic mass, to get the grams, you've got to know moles. So if we work backwards, then this conversion factor has to have grams there. And the only relationship that we're sure of that can give us grams when we're counting is grams per mole. So for copper, yeah, we, just, we were just looking at it, weren't we? 63.55 grams per mole. Okay, so now we got this one. We just need something that'll cancel the moles and uh, yeah, cancel the moles. And this is the number of atoms in a mole, right? 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms per mole, right? So this, now if we work forwards, we work backwards first, now we work forwards, then the atoms cancel, moles cancel, and we're left with grams. So all you have to do is run that calculation. That's the hard part. You know, that's the part that requires brain power. This is just crunching numbers. Okay, I get 4.22 times 10 to the minus 22. 4.22 times 10 to the minus 22 grams. And that appears to be E. Okay. Oh, I forgot to write the problem number. This is uh, four. This is problem four. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to try not to be redundant here. Kick out four, and let's see. All right, so we'll look at six. Should be able to do this one without drawing on the board. Okay, what are the conditions? And then what is the question? You've got a sample of zinc and a sample of aluminum. You have equal number of atoms in each sample. Doesn't say how many. It really doesn't matter to answer the question. Which of the following statements concerning the masses of the samples is true? All right, so let's think about it. If we compare the same number of atoms of zinc and aluminum, which sample is going to be heavier? Zinc is 65.38. Now maybe I will draw on the board. And problem six. 65.38 grams per mole. And aluminum is 26.98 grams per mole. So you have equal numbers of atoms, like one mole each. Then the zinc sample would weigh 65 and aluminum would weigh 26 grams, right? Almost three times as much for zinc. 
So now let's see which one of these answers, uh, A through E, is correct or the best answer for uh, concerning the masses of the samples. The mass of zinc sample is more than twice as great as the mass of the aluminum sample. Uh, yeah, that's true, right? Twice 27 would be 30, uh, 54, right? Not quite that, but if you add another, another 27, it'd be over that. So A is correct. Um, the mass is C. We don't have any oddballs in here. So actually, we found the answer. The mass of zinc sample is more than the mass of the aluminum sample, but not quite twice as. Okay, that's false. Right? We already showed that it's twice as much. The mass of aluminum sample is more than twice as great. Nope. <laughs> that's ludicrous. And the mass of the aluminum sample is more than the mass of the zinc sample. Nope. Can't be. The masses are equal. Nope. Okay. So we, in fact, did find the right answer with the A. All right, that was six. Let's see, where's my pencil? I drop it it's in my hand. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, we should be able to dispatch seven rather quickly. A sample of ammonia has a mass of 43.5 grams. How many molecules are in this sample? Okay. So if you don't know what the formula of ammonia is, you can't do the problem. Right? So you gotta find out what's ammonia. Well, for homework, that's no problem. You just look it up. But for an exam, if you don't know it and it's not given, then you're stuck. So in case you see ammonia somewhere, number seven, it's going to be this. One nitrogen, three hydrogens bound together as a single unit. It's a, it's a molecule. So we have 43.5 grams of it. Let's do this. 43.5 grams. Right. How many molecules? Well, you got to convert it to moles first, don't you? And then you got to convert moles to molecules. Right. So you have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And then what's the molar mass of ammonia? Right. So nitrogen is 14.01. And three times hydrogen is 3.03, which would be four there and seven, 1704. Okay. So now we got it. That's the hard part. We just calculate the values. Uh, 1.5, significant figures, 1.54. What was my exponent? 24. Okay. So that makes it D. Okay. Mark that one off. All right, and skip down to number 11. All right, number 11 tests whether or not you've been practicing writing compounds. Calculate the molar mass of barium sulfite. There's no way you can do that unless you can write the compound. Right? So you need that useful information right? that looks like this. Right? Polyatomic ions, which will be in the same folder as the exam. Only um, 
I understand from little bird told me once you get into that folder using a lockdown browser, you don't have access to anything else but the exam. Right? So before you go into the exam, you need to access that useful information, print it off and keep it with you during the exam. That's perfectly legal in my book anyway. So let's go back to uh, where were we? 11. Barium sulfite. Right? That should be a clue. I mean, there's no, it's not an ide, it's not a sulfide, right? So it's not derived from a single element. Sulfite means that it's derived from a, multi, a polyatomic. So you have barium, let's see, number 11. You have barium, and then you look up sulfite. as a two minus charge, <clears throat> how about barium? Barium is a, an alkaline earth, which means it's a two plus charge. It's in the second column, right? So you only need one of each, right? To balance the charge. So now we can calculate the molar mass. So we look up barium, 137.33, it's a heavy one. And we look up one sulfur, 3207. And three oxygens. One oxygen is 16. Three times 16 is what? 48. And then you just add them together. Let's see, 17, carry the one. One, seven, eight, 11, two. 217.40 grams per mole. And that means the answer is E. All right, 11. We'll move to number 17's next. Okay, scroll down to 17. Okay, there's, now nah, well that's, uh, excuse me. This is the, this is the key. So you have access to this key because it's the review document. So this will tell you in the key that ammonia is in H3. I should have put it earlier in the other one too. Uh, 17, 17. Okay. There we go. <clears throat> I'm gonna get a fresh marker if I can find one here. How about this one? That's better. Okay. A compound is composed of element X and hydrogen. Analysis shows that the compound to be 80% X by mass, with three times as many hydrogen atoms as X atoms per molecule. Which element is element X? All right, so what are we given? Well, we know that X and hydrogen are together. <clears throat> we know that there are three times as many hydrogen atoms as there are X in each molecule. So that could be one of these and three of those. It could be two of those and six of those. It could be three of those and nine of those. But that really shouldn't matter because we're also told that the compound is 80% X by mass. This is 80% here and 20% there. Okay. So um, let's stop for a second and say, if we're going to find out what X is, 
what do we need to know? Well, if we had the atomic number, pretty simple. You know, we could find it on the periodic chart. Just look up the atomic number and there's your element. But it's unlikely from this data that we're going to find that. That's, that's the number of protons. And I don't see any information here that would tell you how many protons that element has. So the other alternative is find out the molar mass of X. If we can find the molar mass, it's almost as definitive as the number of protons, the atomic number. There are places on the periodic table where they're very close together. Neighbors have similar uh, atomic masses and those would give you a little trouble. You'd need a little extra help in finding the, but for most of the elements in the periodic table, uh, if you know the molar mass, you can find the element. So let's take that route. So what do we need to know for the molar mass? Well, the molar mass is so many, uh, the mass per moles, right? The mass in grams per moles. So we have an indication of how to get to the mass and what the mole ratio is from hydrogen to the other one. The problem is we're percent. Right? It's like trying to find the empirical formula from percent composition. You can't work that because percent has no dimensions. So what we have to do is say, all right, say this compound weighs 100 grams. Our sample weighs 100 grams. How much X do you have? If that's the case, then you got 80 grams of X and you have 20 grams of Hydrogen. Hi. Now we can do something with it. 20 grams of hydrogen is how many moles of hydrogen? One point oh one divided into 20. Which is 19 point eight. 19. 0.8 moles of hydrogen. Okay. How many moles of X does that represent? Well, we were told the ratio, right? For every three of these, you have one of those. Or for every six of those, you have two of those. It doesn't matter, really. You got that many moles, then you should have three a third as many X's. Right. So 19.8 divided by three should be the number of moles of X. 6.6. .6. So now we have 6.6 .6 moles of X and that many moles of X corresponds to 80 grams of X because we worked from 20 grams of hydrogen and the other component is 80 grams. So we have six of that many moles a gram and this can be calculated from 80 divided by 6.6. .6. Let's see, 12.12. So you go to your periodic table and you start following along. Right. Right. Uh, about one for hydrogen, about four for helium, and you just keep get, get bigger and bigger and bigger, and you keep going until you find the match. So boron's too light, nitrogen's too heavy, carbon's just right. So our element is carbon. So what's the trick to this one? Well, actually there are two of them. One is, how do you find the element? What information do you need? We don't have enough information for atomic number, so we go for atomic mass. Right? So that's, that's what you need for atomic mass. 
then you go back to the problem and say, do you have the information necessary? Well, we sort of have a mole ratio, uh, but we don't have mass. But we do know that the relative amounts of each one is this. So if we had 100 grams, that's what we would have. So those are the two tricks that get you moving toward the answer. All right. Be sure my board's centered. Here we go. Okay, that was 17. And what did I do? Of course, it's in my hand. <laughs> I amaze myself sometimes. All right. Uh, let's see. Okay. Remember the law of constant composition or definite composition was proposed by Proust. And it just says that each compound has a ratio of masses of the elements that is fixed. And anytime you have a compound that you've identified as that compound based on all the other parameters, then the, the mass composition of that compound is going to be constant, no matter what the source. Okay. So for number 19, we have a substance that contains 35 grams of nitrogen, 5.05 gram, 5 grams of hydrogen, 60 grams of oxygen. How many grams of hydrogen are there in a 152 gram, 153 gram sample of this substance? Okay, this is really simpler than it looks. 19. Okay, so you've got a sample of the substance and we can calculate the composition, the amount of hydrogen in the sample that's given here. That's not a 153 gram sample right there. 60 plus five plus 35 is not 153. So what we need is the ratio of hydrogen to the total first. So you have 5.05 .05 grams of hydrogen in the numerator and the denominator, right? Just because you put it in the numerator doesn't mean you subtracted it from the total, because this is the total. And then we have 35 grams of nitrogen. And then we have 60 grams of oxygen. So what's the fractional composition? Because that's something you can calculate with. Percentage is a little more difficult. So 5.05, .05, and then the total, is that plus 35 and 60. Right. So that's actually 100 grams, that total 35, 60, and five. And then, there you go. So we get 0 0.00505. is the fractional amount of hydrogen in the sample. See if I got my decimals right. One, two, oh, too many zeros. There you go. So now that fractional amount of hydrogen by mass is always gonna be the same. So if we have a 153 gram sample of it, all we need is to multiply by that fraction. Seven point seven. Okay. 
That's how much hydrogen we have in that 153 gram sample. A, I rounded it off to two. Uh, yeah, legally I could have kept three. Yeah, 772. Okay, that's 19. All right, and we're good till, let me check the time here. We're good to 345. Okay. Moving along. That's 19. And the next one I picked out was, let's see, skip some more, 32. Let's yeah, see, I need to move some stuff. I can't get to my scroll bar. <laughs> so I have to use the the scroll wheel on my mouse. 32. Okay, here we go. The empirical formula of styrene, 32. All right. Styrene. Everybody knows polystyrene. Styrene is the uh, building block of that polymer that you find, the polystyrene, that you'll find uh, lots of places. It, if it's prepared properly, it makes a very good insulator, and you find it in uh, coolers, you know, in between the plastic shell or just out there on its own. Right? You can buy really cheap polystyrene coolers that are they got about that much foam on the outside and that's it there's nothing protecting it from that that's why they're cheap so when I bought one um, I put it in the back of my van and the first one I bought I accidentally spilled some gasoline back there <laughs> and he found out pretty quick styrene is extremely soluble in gasoline so that one was ruined. It had holes in it all over the place. So the next one I bought, I had some shrink wrap. So I took the shrink wrap and I wrapped it up really good. Just wrapped the whole thing all the way around and every which way I could go. I tested the, the shrink wrap to be sure it was stable against gasoline and it is. And then once I get it all wrapped up, then I find the edge where the lid is and then I just cut it loose. There you go protected. But this styrene they're talking about is the subunit, the building block. And the molar mass is given, well, it's carbon and hydrogen only. Uh, the empirical formula actually is given like that. Carbon hydrogen. That's that ratio is the empirical formula. The molar mass is 104.1. So the molar the molecular weight, the molar mass is 104.1 grams per mole. So we need the multiplier. How many times do we need to multiply that to produce a molecular weight that size? The simplest way is to calculate what I call the empirical weight. This one plus that one. In this case, it's just one and one. So this would be 12.01 and 1.01, .01, which would be 13.02. And then you divide 13.02 into that number. 104.1 and then 13.02 divide is very close to 8. So that means x equals 8. And the formula is C8H8. All right. Uh, in this case, that's uh, B. Okay, I've got uh, 33 marked off also. So 33 is asking us for 
the empirical formula for adipic acid. Adipic acid is one of those fatty acids that that everybody has. They just combined with uh, glycerol as with a ester bond. And if it's if it's a complete fatty acid, there are three of them, three fatty acids on each molecule. Okay, so 33 wants us to determine the empirical formula for adipic acid with that data. Right. So we're going to need Henry Ford for this one. We're going to do the same calculation for carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and then we're going to combine them. We're going to find the ratio, the mole ratio of each one using that data. And, and all it's asking for is the empirical formula, right? The simplest whole number ratio of elements. So if we start off with 49.32% carbon, 43.84% oxygen, and 6.85% hydrogen, and that's all there is. There's nothing else. You can satisfy yourself. Add it up. Looks like it's close to 100. Now, here's the problem. We don't have grams. You can't calculate moles, and you can't get the mole ratio without moles. So we have to make an assumption. If the percentage composition is 49.32 parts per 100 carbon, that's 49.32 grams per 100 grams. So this becomes 49.32 grams. This one is 43.84 grams. And this one is 6.85 grams. Now we can work with that. What we need is a conversion factor that's unique for each one. So this one to make moles We need 12.01 for carbon. Oxygen is 16. And hydrogen is 1.01. So now we do a calculation and establish the mole ratio of each one. So this one divided into that one. is 4.11 okay. moles of carbon. This one, 43.8416, is 2.74. Okay. And the last one, is 6.78. All right, that is the mole ratio, but it's not the whole number mole ratio. So we can't provide an empirical formula because it's the simplest whole number ratio. The next step is you wanna start converting these to whole numbers. The simplest way to get whole numbers out of this, at least for one of them, is to take the smallest one and divide by it. So that one will be one. And then you do the same thing for each one. Because once you've established the ratio of moles, if you multiply them or divide them by any number, it's still the same ratio. Well, this one's going to be one. Okay. Let's say this one divided by 2.74 is uh, about one and a half. So we can start rounding now. As long as it's very, very, very close, we can round to that number. 
6.78 and 2.74. That's two and a half. Now you can string the decimals out there if you want. That's okay. But I think it, if we start rounding a little earlier, start rounding a little earlier, then it's easier to see the trend toward uh, whole number ratios. Right? So you notice that each one of these has a half. How do you get rid of a half? If you multiply by two, the half is gone. So if you multiply each one of these by two, this one is three carbon. This one is two oxygen. And this one is five hydrogen. Okay, now we have our whole number ratio. So dipic acid, actually, when we write uh, organic compounds like this, carbon comes first, then hydrogen, then oxygen. So I'm going to do it that way. Uh, also, because that's the way it's shown here in the answers. So we have three carbons, we have five hydrogens, and we have two oxygens. So three, five, two is the ratio. That's why A is the answer. That's the empirical formula for adipic acid. That's not the molecular formula. Right? In order to find that, we need some more information. We need to know the molar mass of adipic acid. Then we can do the ratio thing and find out the multiplier. But for now, that answers the question. Okay, am I still lined up? No, it's walking again. There we go. Okay, so that was 32 and 33. All right, so let's see what's next on the agenda. And of course, I'm running out of time. Okay, number 40 is balancing an equation. So let's look at it. Scroll, scroll, scroll till we get to 40. There we go. What's the sum of the coefficients of the following equation when it's balanced using smallest whole numbers? Okay, so we need to balance the equation with the smallest whole number ratio. And then we need to add them up and look for the answer. All right. So we have um, uh, Na, NH2, which is, uh, what is that? Sodium amide, I think. Anyway, uh, sodium NH2, and then we have NO3, yeah, and then we produce sodium azide, I know that one, sodium uh, N3, and then we have, uh, I'm running out of space, I want to start over again. Let's go over here. NaNH2 plus NO3 sodium nitrate. That's a fertilizer, by the way. Sodium nitrate. It's a very good fertilizer. It's a it's a low a low concentration of nitrogen, but it's very effective for your crops. I mean, they take it up almost 100 percent. There's no loss. It's only 16% nitrogen by weight, but it's very effective. The other problem is it adds sodium to your soil, which 
increases the salt index, which some plants don't like. But that's neither here nor there. We need to balance this equation. Oops. N3. And then sodium hydroxide. And NH3. Ammonia. Okay. So how do we balance this? Well, we set up a budget. Right? Notice that that NO3 is torn apart from one side to the other. Nitrogens occur in different places. So we cannot use that trick where you have polyatomics that retain their identity across the arrow. Right? We have to do each element individually. So we've got sodium, we've got nitrogen, we've got hydrogen, and we've got oxygen. Yeah. So now we do a tally. On this side, we have two sodiums. And we have one, two nitrogens, two hydrogens, and three oxygens. So let's see, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's good. Now on this side, we have sodiums. One, two. Nitrogens, we have three, four. Hydrogens, we have one, four. And oxygens, we have one. Okay, so that's one, four, five, six, seven, eight, eleven. Six, ten, eleven. Okay, so that's where we start from. The next thing is, you know, how do you deal with this? Because you've got nitrogens everywhere and you've got sodiums everywhere. <clears throat> so, really, all you can do is just start someplace. If we, if we do nitrogens, then which one of these nitrogens are we going to do, right? To turn two into four. Can't be done. Not with a single coefficient. So let's skip that. Let's go down to hydrogen, see if hydrogen works better, right? So we've got four hydrogens. We need four hydrogens on this side. Okay, that's a little easier to manage. We can just change this one and get four hydrogens. Okay. And we've changed the sodiums from two to two plus one is three. We've also changed the number of nitrogens, right? Two, three nitrogens. Okay. How about oxygen? We haven't got only oxygens in only one place. We may want to hold the oxygen still well, that won't, that won't help us any. Let's go ahead and do the oxygens. We got three oxygens here. We need three here. Right. So that gives us three oxygens. We got three oxygens now. We have three sodiums plus one is four sodiums. And we've multiplied by hydrogens. So we got three hydrogens plus three hydrogens is six hydrogens, correct? Okay. I'm looking to see if there's an easier way to do this. Not that we're privy to yet. So, we've managed to do these and these. We did these first. So, it looks like sodiums and nitrogens are odd even. And we haven't touched this one or that one yet. So, if we need, what if we multiplied three times that one and four times this one? 
we need 12, right? 12 nitrogens. How would we get 12 nitrogen? We've got two here already. What if we said five here? And if we need 12 nitrogens on this side, we could use either one of these. Ah, this is going nowhere fast. We're going to be here all day trying to figure this one out. <clears throat> Let me see. Let me see if I even wrote it right. That's right. Okay. I wrote it correctly. Let's start all over again. I know that's what you wanted to hear. <laughs> so there's our original tally. And let's get rid of this, get rid of that. We would eventually get there that way, but if I don't have time to do it that way. So that's two, four, four, and one. Let's go back down here. We started off good. Three, we need three oxygens on this side. Right, so we need three here. So that makes three, four sodiums. Right. That makes three oxygens. <clears throat> Is that right? One sodium? Three sodiums, yep, and three oxygens, and three plus three is six hydrogens. Okay, that much we did right. Now, What if we were to say, to make the sodiums right, instead of messing with this one, we mess with this one. And we said three sodiums here. That would mean three sodiums plus one is four. Okay, I guess that one. That's three nitrogens and one nitrogen is four nitrogens and six hydrogens. Okay. <clears throat> so that would be an evil problem type to give you on a test. <laughs> you spend the whole time trying to figure that one problem out. So I think I'll refrain from going that route. Uh, just a second, let me check this message. Oh, okay. Sorry. <clears throat> message from the president I thought I better read it <clears throat> okay so now we have to add up the coefficients the one thing you don't want to do is add up the numbers that are visible and forget the ones that are not if you've got that's there its coefficient is one so one plus three is four plus one is five 
plus one is six, plus three is nine. So that's why the answer is E for this one. I should have picked an easier one, right? I should have recognized <clears throat> anytime you've got elements scattered across several compounds that you're in for a real hair raising adventure. But that was 40. See, and I've eaten up a lot of time doing that. Uh, let's see. I got a note here. Let me follow through with it. Okay. Let's do uh, 45. And then we'll skip to 60, which uses the same diagram, but asks a different question. So we'll be in the same mindset. And we can get kill uh, two birds with one stone. Okay, 45. All right, 45. Uh, a chemical reaction has the equation 2A plus B, you'll see. Which of the following figures best illustrates a stoichiometric ratio of A and B? Stoichiometric ratio means exactly the right number of moles, the same, the proportion of moles of one component to the next given in the balanced equation. So there should be two A's for every B for the stoichiometric ratio. All right, so let's see. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight A's, and one, two, three, four B's. That's the correct ratio. Right. So one is good. Rum numeral one. We know that one's right. How about the next one? We have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight A's, and three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight B's. Wrong ratio. Right. In that case, You've got twice as many B's as you need. How about the next one? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight B's and one, two, three, four A's. All right? You have a lot more B's than you need here. And how about four? Four's got C's in it. And I'm reading into the question. This should be a ratio of reactants before the reaction occurs. Right? Besides, even if we ignore the C's, um, you've got the wrong number of C's in there because A is four and C is four, and the ratio of A to C is the same as A to B. Right? So that couldn't be right anyway, whether it was before or after the reaction. So the answer to this one is, is one, only one, and that's A. So let's uh, skip over to 60 and use that same diagram. <clears throat> let's see. I found it quicker way. Here we go. There you go. Okay. For this one, we're looking for the, the case in which B is the limiting reactant. What do we mean by limiting reactant? That's the one that runs out first. So in a stoichiometric situation where you have twice as many A as B, then if you say have uh, 8A and 4B, you're stoichiometric. But if we go down to 3B or 2B, then B is limiting. Well, actually, it's a different set of pictures, isn't it? Okay, so let's we have to look at each one now. So what's the ratio? The uh, first one is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six A's. One, two, three, four, five, six B's. Which one would be limiting in that case? You need twice as many B's as A to be stoichiometric, so A would be limiting. 
we got half as many A's as we need. How about uh, Roman numeral two? One, two, three, four, five B's and two, four, six, eight, 10, 11 A's. Right. So we don't have quite as, as many A's as we need. We need 12 A's. If we got six B's, no, we got five B's. Five B's, which means, oh, five B's against, let's see, 60. You have five B's in Roman numeral two and three, six, nine, 11 A's. So 11 A's would require five and a half B's, which is less than five and a half. Five is less than, so uh, Roman numeral two, the limiting case of B. B is the limiting reactant in two. We can look at the others, um, but based on the choices you have, you've got the right answer already. We got four B's and one, two, three, four, five, six A's. All right, so four B's means you need eight A's and they're not enough A's, so that's limiting. Uh, three B's in Roman numeral four, you need six A's. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's stoichiometric, two to one. So the answer is, is uh, B, which is Roman numeral two. Okay, so let's go back to, let's go back to 46, a stoichiometry problem. So let me see if I can do this fast again like I did before. 46, 46. There it is right there. All right, what's the problem? 7.11 grams of potassium chlorate, which is this compound right here, was decomposed according to the following equation, right? Two potassium chlorides yields two potassium chlorides plus three oxygens. Is that balanced? Well, let's see. We got two potassiums, two potassiums on this side. We got two chlorines, two chlorines, six oxygens, six oxygens. It's balanced. And it looks like it's the simplest whole number ratio because that's odd and the other two are even. How many moles of oxygen are produced when 7.11 grams of the compound are decomposed? All right, so we need to work from a balanced equation, which we have. And we need two KCLs and three oxygens. And we're given 7.11 grams of that compound. And the question is, how many moles of oxygen are produced? Okay. So remember the rule, after you balance the equation, write the compounds correctly, balance the equation, and then what do you know and what's the question? We know this, and we know we need to get there, but we can't do it because that's mass and this is moles. You can't go anywhere in a balanced equation unless you have moles. We're stuck right here until we convert that to moles of this compound. Then we can make the conversion. So how do we convert here? You need a conversion factor grams and moles in a quotient situation, that means molar mass every time. So how, how much potassium break? 39.10, right? Chlorine, 35, 45. Three oxygens, 48. I'll use my calculator for this one. 39.1. 
35.45 and 48. 122.55. 122.55. Okay. So that's how many moles. Once we do the calculation. Five point eight zero times ten squared was it? No, ten to the minus two. Excuse me, ten to the minus two moles of potassium chlorate. Now we need a conversion factor that will give us moles of oxygen. So what's the conversion factor? There and there. Three O twos for every two KClO threes. So three times this divided by two will get you your answer. Eight point seven. Let's see. Three significant figures. Eight point seven zero. times 10 to the still minus two moles of oxygen. Oh, standard notation. So we got to move the decimal. One, two. Point zero eight seven zero. Point zero eight seven zero is D. That's your answer. There we go. That was, uh, let's see. Done that one, we've done that one, 46. Now, the next one we have on my list is 64. Let me see if we need to do that one. I'll scroll down so you can see what I'm looking at. 64, there it is. Let's see, for the reaction, For the reaction N2, nitrogen gas plus hydrogen gas, yields N2H4, dinitrogen tetra, te, tetrahydride. If the percent yield of this reaction is 82%, what's the actual mass of hydrogen produced when 25.57 grams of nitrogen react with 4.45 grams of hydrogen? Okay, multi-step couple, three ideas that need to be addressed. Uh, let me put this, I don't need that space. So let's see, we're still on chapter three. There we go. Our balanced equation is N2. And two hydrogens. Yields N to H four. Probably a gas also. In, no, it's liquid. How about that. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. It's a very reactive liquid, actually. All right, so that's balanced. And we're given 25.57 grams of nitrogen. And uh, 4.45 grams of hydrogen. Okay. And we're also given the yield of the experiment. 82% right? yield. So zero, 82.0. So when we finally figure out which one of these is limiting, and how much of that can be produced, then we still have to apply the percent yield to answer the question, um, what is the actual mass of hydrazine produced? 
okay? So how do we figure out the limiting one? You find out how many moles of this there are and how many moles of that will produce. Then you find out how many moles of this there are and how many moles of that that will produce. Compare the two and the smallest one wins. The one that produces the least amount of hydrazine is the limiting one and that's the one that determines how much hydrazine is produced. So we got to convert this to moles, okay? Which is, let's go ahead and do them step by step. Four point four one. of hydrogen. Okay, so how many moles of this one? Well, we need to multiply that times the molar mass of nitrogen, right? Each nitrogen is 14.01 and two of them together is 2802. So divide that into this, 2557. Twenty-eight point oh two, and I get point nine one two six. Okay, now we need to convert each one to hydrazine. We need a, con a conversion factor: nitrogen, hydrazine, hydrogen. Uh, hydrazine. All right? So what's the ratio? Well, for every two of these, you get one of those. For every one of these, you get one of those. So this one is 0 0.9126 moles of hydrazine. And this one is two into that, which is 2.21 moles of hydrazine. All right, so which one wins? Nitrogen is the limiting reactant. So we're gonna have this many moles of hydrazine. How many grams does that represent? We need the molar mass, don't we? So what's the molar mass of hydrazine? Well, two nitrogens, we just did that one, 28.02. And four hydrogens is 4.04. .04. So that's 3206. Which should be uh, 29.26. 29.26 grams. But now we need efficiency. So we convert that into a fraction, right? 0.82. That's how much you get out of it. And that's 23.99. or the best answer, whichever that happens to be, or I didn't even write the number up here, 64. For 64, uh, 29, 23.99 is close to B, 24, rounded off to three decimal places. Okay? Now, if we hadn't used that number, we would have picked 29.2, probably, right? Because that answer's there, but it's the wrong answer. <laughs> Sneaky. 64. Okay, what's next? I need to get into chapter four, don't I? Um, 
All right, we went over earlier a problem which we were uh, using the average atomic mass in atomic mass units. And number 71 is along those same lines. And in order to solve 71, you just weight the contribution of each isotope by its abundance, its fractional abundance. So if we were to go down to 71, hey, let's see, let's do this. 71 here, right? You would take 0 0.0582 times 54 and 0 0.9166 times 56. Those are the fractional contributions of each one. And 0 0.0219 times 57 and <laughs> 0 0.0033 times 58. Oh no, excuse me. You wouldn't use the, the uh, mass numbers, right? Because we're given the actual mass of each one. So instead of 54, you would use 53.94. 56 would be 55.935. 57 would be 56.935. And 58 would be 57.933 times each one of their respective abundances. Then once you've multiplied those over, add them together, and you should get 55.85. It's a simple calculation, really. Let's see, how are we doing? Sliding over. Okay, so, that being said, I'm sort of halfway skipping that one. <clears throat> um, let's be sure we understand what's meant by the next one. Not that one, next one. Here we go. What's the empirical formula for the following compounds? If you look at those compounds, the way they're described, the way they're depicted, we're looking at molecules. These are the actual ratios of atoms in this molecule. In this one, you have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons, and one, two, three, four, five, six hydrogens. So the molecular ratio in this one would be C6H6. But the question is asking for empirical formula. Reduce that to the simplest whole number ratio, CH. Similarly, this one is not C2H4, it's CH2. And for this one, you count everything up and do the same thing because it's got carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in it. All right. All right, let's get on to chapter four. And I've got maybe 15 minutes left, so I'm going to go over. And no, we're not going to do that one. Okay. Did I not mark any? Oh, yeah, I did mark some. Okay, that's good. Here we go. So I'm going to skip over to number... Number 12. Yeah, number 12. We'll do 12 and 14 on that page. I shouldn't be doing slow like this. I'll be using my fast method. Okay, there's 12. Now we're talking about solutions, right? Stoichiometry and solutions. And let me change this. Chapter four, and this is number 12. All right. How many grams of sodium chloride are contained in 350 milliliters of 0 0.287 molar 
solution of sodium chloride. Right? So, what's the question? We're looking for how many grams of sodium chloride. What's the mass of sodium chloride? Oops. And we're given this information. Volume, 350 milliliters of the solution. Molarity, 0 0.2. 287 molar. Okay. So what can you get from that information? Well, with a little tweaking, you can get how many moles of sodium chloride you have, but then you got to convert it to grams, right? So what's the formula we're working from? The definition of molarity is uh, moles per volume, and this is in liters, and that's obviously in moles. So we have molarity and we have volume. So that means N equals M times V. But in this configuration, V has to be in liters. So you convert that to liters, right? Move the decimal place to the left, three, and you get 0 0.350 liters. So now we know how many moles there are. Uh, 0 0.10045. 0 0.10420. Zero. Moles of sodium chloride. Now we can convert to grams, right? We just need a conversion factor. That will get rid of moles and leave us with grams, right? And that's always the molar mass. So sodium is uh, 23 and chlorine is 35.45. So that's 58.45. times that previous number, which is 5.87, uh, three places, yeah, 5.87 grams. Okay, that's why the answer is B. Okay, that was 12. Now let's see what 14 has to offer. All right, 14, here we go, scroll down some. What mass of calcium chloride is needed to prepare 3.950 liters of 1.49 molar solution? Okay, we can calculate how many moles is required. You know, we just did one like that. We used the formula to find out how many moles. And then we converted moles to grams, right? 12. Yeah, we've already done one like that. We're going to skip 14. Because that, uh, that horse has already been beaten. All right, let's use this one, 18. Okay, 18. What volume of 18 molar sulfuric acid must be used to prepare 2.3 liters of 0 0.15 molar H2SO4? Okay, so in this case, you can use the expression molarity of the concentrated times volume of the concentrated equals molarity of the dilute times volume of the dilute. 
We just have to decide which is which, right? Which one's the concentrated? It should be obvious. 18 molar sulfuric acid is the concentrated molarity. What's the volume of the concentrated? Ha, huh, that's the question. What's the molarity of the diluted solution once you get finished? 0 0.145. And what's the volume of the diluted? 2.30 liters, right? So I'm gonna leave it that way. 2.30 liters. We could change it to milliliters right now. And then the answer would come out in milliliters because this is a ratio, right? Remember that? The volume, you can leave the volume the way it is without changing it to liters if you've got this side by side comparison rather than the original formula. The original formula says you have to be liters. But in this case, liters cancel or milliliters would cancel. So if you start with milliliters, you end up with milliliters. But if we do it with liters, then we can convert to milliliters. So this is going to be that times that divided by this. So I get 1.85 times 10 to the minus 2. liters and all of our answers are in milliliters looks like i'm missing something there doesn't it yeah there should have been something right here next to this times 10 to the third fortunately that's not the right answer so this would be how many milliliters well let's do it this way Right? How many milliliters in a liter? 10 to the third. So 10 to the third and 10 to the minus two times each other, you add the exponents. So three and a minus two is minus one, is one. Which is approximately 19 milliliters. Oops, sorry. There we go. Then you move the decimal place over one, round it off two places, and you got 19. That's why A is the answer for this one. Okay, <clears throat> so let me see. Um, all right, we have a series of, of problems starting with 26. Twenty six. Here we go. It's too far. There we go. We want to identify what type of reactions we're dealing with here. Okay. Twenty six. So you got these three reactions. And this one, cerium and iodine. Use this one plus two cerium plus, and the third one. What's HOAC? 
It's an abbreviation for acetic acid. Right? It would be written HC2H3O2 in your book, probably. Plus NH3 yields uh, NH4 with a plus sign plus O A A C minus. So that just shows that we lost this hydrogen. It was transferred over here to this this ammonia molecule to make ammonium and leave us with this acetate ion. Okay, so what kind of reactions do we have here? Well, uh, from looking at the, uh, excuse me, uh, went too far. Shoot, 26, 26, there. From looking at the, um, the answers, uh, this one says they're all acid-base reactions. Well, they're not. Right? There's you got to have a transfer of proton to be an acid-base reaction here. That's an acid. That's a base. Proton was transferred. So that one's an acid-base, but the rest of them are not. Uh, B, unbalanced reactions. Well, if we check them out, we find that they, they're still balanced, right? Two ceriums, two ceriums, two iodide, two iodide, one lead, two iodide, one lead, to add that. They're all balanced, so that's not it. How about C, precipitation? Which one would be a precipitation reaction? If you look at lead iodide, and in your useful information, you have that chart, solubility chart, you'll find that lead iodide is insoluble. Just because it doesn't have an S behind it doesn't mean it isn't true. It just doesn't have that information with you. So that one is precipitation reaction. How about this one? Cerium four plus goes to cerium three plus and iodide minus one goes to iodide zero. We're looking at oxidation states. That's a redox reaction. Another possibility is this one's an ion, which means it's part of a compound. And this is iodine as uh, a neutral element. Whenever you see that, you know it's a redox. So we've got precipitation, redox, acid base. That's E. All right, how about this one? <clears throat> 27. I'm not going to write them all up here this time. <laughs> okay. What type of reaction is this? Notice you have potassium here is an element. So it's, it's, re, it's uh, oxidation state is zero. But over here, it's an ion in KBr compound. That's changed from zero to plus one. That is definitely a redox reaction. Okay? I don't see any other possibilities. Well, bromine, of course, it was an element. It became part of a compound, so it's redox too. So... Based on both of those, this is a redox reaction. Uh, silver nitrate, sodium chloride yields silver chloride. These are both aqueous solutions. Silver chloride is now solid. It means it precipitates. That's a precipitation reaction. So we got redox, precipitation, and I don't see any other resemblance here to a different type of reaction. So that's the only thing we've got going for us. <coughs> Hydrochloric acid. And potassium hydroxide react to form water in KCl. That's an acid-base reaction every time. An acid plus a base makes water and a salt. In fact, that's the definition of salt. An acid and a base together produce a salt. So we've got uh, redox, precipitation, 
acid base. That's B. So here we've got two reactions. All right. So what do we got going here? Let's see, we've got an aqueous solution here and an aqueous solution of salts of a type of salt here. And we've got an aqueous solution here. Looks like a double replacement, but that's not an option. Right? Zinc swaps places with silver. But when it does, silver and bromine combine to form a solid. That's precipitation. How about this one? KBr and silver nitrate. Here we go again. Silver and bromine form a solid. That's precipitation. In fact, that's the only thing I can see in these two. Without error, they're both precipitation reactions. So that's why C is the answer. They're not acid based and you can look right at a uh, test taking technique. Oxidation reduction, nope. Acid base, nope. Precipitation is the only possibility. It's neither one of these top two. Okay, now for this one, the question is, how can we classify every one of these three reactions? They might be multiple types of reactions, but what do they all have in common? That's the question. Well, let's see, how about this first one? Aluminum and bromine elements become part of a compound. That's redox. In fact, it's nothing but redox. Ah, yes, it is something else. It's a combination or a synthesis reaction. Simple to complex, but that's not one of our options. But it is an oxidation reduction and that's an option. So, uh, Silver oxide becomes silver and oxygen. That's a decomposition, but that's not one of our choices either. A decomposition, uh, in this case, is also a redox from a compound to an element. And this one, CH4 and O2, is CO2 and water. Right? That's methane plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide and water. Anytime you have a combustion, Every combustion is a redox reaction. So all of them are redoxes. Oxidation reduction reactions, A. Okay. All right. Oh, they want us to look at, let me scooch over a little bit because I can't see everything. You have exposed electrodes of a light bulb in a solution of H2SO4. A solution, we assume it's aqueous, of H2SO4 is what? Sulfuric acid. The light bulb is on. That means the solution conducts electricity, which means it's an electrolyte. You add a dilute solution and the bulb grows dim. Which of the following could be in the solution? All right, this is a little detective work. So why does that solution conduct electricity in the first place? Because you have this in solution. And those ions conduct electricity. So what would make the solution grow dim? If you remove any of those, either all of these or some of these or some of those, reduce the number of electrolytes, a number of ions. So which one of these would work? Well, let's see. Um, what does barium hydroxide do? Oh, okay. You add a dilute solution. We don't know what's in the solution. Which of the following could be in the solution? Barium hydroxide, sodium nitrate, potassium sulfate, copper nitrate. Let's start from the bottom and we'll work our way up. 
So what you do is you say copper and sulfate, right? Uh, excuse me, nitrate, pardon me. Right, there are gonna be two of these. So double replacement. If this one interacts with that one, what do you get? You get the same number of electrolytes, right? Same number of ions, because these are both, this is soluble. Copper sulfate is soluble, right? So copper nitrate can't be it. It will not reduce the number of ions. In fact, it'll make it more conductive. How about potassium sulfate? Well, look what you got. This gives you more sulfuric acid, and this gives you a soluble salt. Potassium sulfate is soluble, right? So that doesn't do it either. How about sodium nitrate? Sodium nitrate. Sodium salts are all soluble. Sodium sulfate is soluble. Nitric acid is soluble. So that can't be it. So by process of elimination, we, well, actually, if it says none of these, now we have to go to barium hydroxide to be sure. Barium hydroxide. Let's see, there are two of these and one of those. So look at your chart, solubility chart, and look across the top at barium and then down to sulfate. It's insoluble. That makes a solid. So you're removing those two ions from the solution. How about this one? H plus and OH. What does that make? That makes water. And water is very weakly ionized. It's an insulator. So you're removing hydrogen ions as well by turning them into water. Actually, this is an acid base reaction, right? That makes water, this makes the salt. But the salt in this case is insoluble. Right? So you're removing all the ions from solution. That's the only possibility. Barium hydroxide will do the job. Okay, that was 30. How about uh, let's do uh, 38, 39, and 40. They're all based on the same same principle. So I'm just going to say 38 through 40. All right, so let's, um, 38, here we go. All right. Aqueous solutions of barium chloride and silver nitrate are mixed to form solid silver chloride and aqueous barium nitrate. So they're giving you some hints here. The balanced molecular equation contains which of the following terms for 38? For 39, the balanced complete ionic equation contains which? And then 40 is the net ionic. So we've got to go through and construct our balanced equation in those three formats, the molecular, the complete ionic, the net ionic, to answer these three questions. So we might as well do that right off the bat and then answer the questions. So we got barium chloride, silver nitrate in solution. Barium chloride, silver, oops, went too far. Silver nitrate in solution yields. And it told us, right? Uh, silver chloride, solid, and barium nitrate. Silver, chloride, solid, 
and barium nitrate. There we go. Now you have to write those compounds correctly. Barium is a two plus charge. It's, it's an alkaline earth. Chlorine is a uh, halogen with a minus one charge, so you need two of them. Silver nitrate, plus one, minus one. Silver chloride, plus one, minus one. Barium nitrate, plus two, minus one, so you need two of them. And this is aqueous. Okay. Now we need to balance. All right, we can do that without a budget. You got one barium here, one barium there, two chlorines here, you need two chlorines there. Right? So that makes two silvers, we need two silvers here. So now let's check it. One barium, two chlorines, two silvers, two nitrates. We're balanced. So we can answer the first question, 38. The balanced molecular equation contains which of the following terms? Right. Does it contain, and now notice that in the answers you have coefficients. So if the coefficient is absent, then that term is not accurate. This one has a two in front of it, right? So A is wrong. B does have a two in front of it. So B is right. And there's no, none of these, two of these, that kind of mess. So you can stop there. You got the right answer there, two silver chlorides. The next one we need is a complete ionic equation. So you have to take this one, two plus aqueous, and then two chlorides aqueous, plus two silvers, aqueous, plus two nitrates, aqueous. Notice that if you have a subscript, that becomes a coefficient. Or if you have a coefficient, that propagates through all of them. So you have two here and two there. Okay. This one, is a solid. It does not change. Then we have a barium two plus aqueous plus two nitrates aqueous. So there's your complete ionic equation and we look at the possibilities um, A, two BA two plus. Nope, there's only one up. Okay. How about uh, chloride? A single chloride? Nope. There's two of them. One's not enough. Two silvers. Yep, two silvers are here. Right. So that's right. One nitrate? No, there's two of them. Uh, silver chloride? Aqueous? No, it's a solid. Right. So C has to be the answer for that one. Now, how do you do the net ionic equation? You get rid of all the spectators, the terms that are the same on both sides. So we have uh, barium is on both sides. And nitrate is on both sides. So now what we have is 2Cl minus aqueous plus 2 silvers aqueous yields 2 silver chloride. But that's not the simplest whole number ratio, is it? So we've got to simplify it. There you go. Now we can look for <clears throat> the term. We do have a silver aqueous. We don't have a barium. We don't have a nitrate. 
and we never have we never had hydrogens in there. <coughs> and silver chloride aqueous is also wrong again. So the only one that fits is this right here. Okay. All right. So um, I'm out of time, but like usual, I'm going to keep talking. Finish this review so that you can have a look at it on the recording. But obviously, there, there are several other recordings. Right, they're just previous semesters that might be equally as instructive. Uh, let's see, 46. Let's see if we need to bother with that one. Okay. If all the chloride in 3.734 gram sample of an unknown metal chloride is precipitated as silver chloride with 70.9 milliliters, what is the percentage of chloride in the sample? Okay, we can do that one. Okay, so we're looking for the percentage of chloride in the original sample. <clears throat> this looks like an analytical procedure right, that someone would be using uh, to determine some component of an unknown sample. So if all the chloride in a 3.734 gram sample, that's the total mass of the sample, 3.734, mass of our sample. And if we precipitate it, all the chloride as silver chloride, so we're gonna take that chloride and precipitate it with silver. Okay, so that's the reaction that we're, we're taking that chloride and precipitating it uh, as silver chloride. And in order to do that, we have 70.9 milliliters of silver nitrate. <clears throat> and the silver nitrate is this concentration. Zero, one, zero. Molar. Okay, what's the percentage of the chloride? Well, in order to do the percentage of the chloride, we need to know the mass of the chloride relative to the mass of the sample, right? So that's really what we're looking for. We need to know the mass of the chloride to do the calculation, right? So <clears throat> if this exact amount of silver nitrate of that concentration is required, then the number of moles of silver that we use is equal to the number of moles of chloride, exactly equal to it. See? So how many moles of silver were actually used in this experiment? Well, we can convert this to liters, right? 0 0.07, uh, 0, 0.90, zero nine zero liters and then that would be times molarity would be the moles of silver and the moles of chloride one point four two five times ten to the minus two
moles of silver, which is equal to moles of chloride, because we now know the ratio is one to one. So that's the moles of chloride. Um, what's the mass of chloride? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> chloride ions and chloride atoms are virtually the same mass because that extra electron doesn't add much. So you can assume that this is 35.45 grams per mole. And you would say, multiply that. Well, let's see, you want moles on the bottom, grams on the top. Yeah, so we do 35.45 there. So this would be the mass of the chloride. <clears throat> 0 0.5052 grams of chloride. Okay, so now we can do percent composition. We can say 0 0.5052 grams of chloride per 3.734 gram sample times 100. Right? So let's see what that is. Thirteen point five percent. Let's see how many fig, uh, three significant fig four, thirteen point five three. Okay, well, that's why the answer is B. <clears throat> that took a lot of work, <clears throat> but it requires you to recognize that when you precipitate this with that, the ratio is one to one. And we know how many moles of silver were used, right? Because we know the, the, num the volume and the concentration, right? This is, this is a type of titration. Uh, it is past the time, so uh, if any of you have to go, uh, let me be sure I've got everybody tallied in here. I'm, I'm only missing, uh, not here, and not here, and not here. Okay, so I've, everybody's accounted for, it looks like. So if you need to go, go ahead. And I'll finish the uh, review and post it as possible. Okay, so uh, let's see. I also had 47 checked. Let me see if that's worth looking at. You have 88.6 milliliters of 2.5 molar solution of sodium chromate. You also have 125 milliliters of 2.5 molar silver nitrate. Calculate the concentration of sodium after the two solutions are mixed together. Okay. <laughs> this is kind of a trick question, <clears throat> but I'll do it anyway. 47. All right. So we've got sodium chromate mixed together with silver nitrate. Okay, so what does that give us? Sodium nitrate, which is soluble, plus silver chromate, which is a solid. So there's your precipitate. It's a precipitation reaction, a double replacement. 
And we're also given 88.6 milliliters of this, 88.6 milliliters of 2.5 molar. Oops, sorry, molar. And this solution is 125 milliliters of 2.5 molar. Okay, so there, that one, and there's that one. Mix them together. Question is, what's the concentration of sodium after the two solutions are mixed together? All right. <clears throat> Trick question. The temptation is to say, all right, we have a definite amount of that, a definite amount of that, so there's going to be a limiting reactant, which is true. But do we need to know the limiting reactant? Only if we're going after this, silver and chromate, but we're not. The question is, what's the sodium ion concentration? Right? What's happening to the sodium? Sodium soluble here and soluble there. Sodium is a spectator, right? And this equation is not even balanced. It doesn't need to be balanced. Right? You can save yourself a lot of time if you recognize that fact. Sodium is a spectator. So all the sodium you have here ends up as a free ion in the products. So how much sodium do you have? Well, um, I may not have mentioned this to you before, but if you multiply 2.50 molar times 88.6 milliliters, the unit of measure here is millimoles, not moles, millimoles. Why? Because this is a thousandth milliliters a thousandth of a liter. So if the liter times molarity produces moles, then the milliliter times molarity produces millimoles. So um, here we go. 2.5 here, 88.6 times. So that's 221.5 millimoles. 221.5 millimoles or 0.2215 moles. So what's the concentration of sodium now? The sodium was, didn't react with anything. It's still there. But what changed? The volume changed. So now you have this many millimoles. And what's the volume? 88.6 milliliters and of 125 milliliters. All right, so I, I explain molarity times milliliters is equal to millimoles. But if you divide millimoles by milliliters, you get molarity. So milli millimoles divided by milliliters will give you molarity. So we divide that by 88.6 plus 125, and I get 1.04 molar sodium ions. Oh, hold on a second. You know what I did wrong? I got the wrong answer, but where did I go wrong? How many moles of sodium did you start out with? Well, you started out with this many millimoles of sodium chromate. How many millimoles of sodium did you end up with? 443. Point zero. So this should be 2.08. You actually have twice the concentration of sodium ions as chromates. Right. So that's why the answer is closer to C.
than it is to B. All right. Um, 47. Yeah, we got that one. Let's see. Um, okay. This is one that we had to do. Uh, maybe we haven't done it yet. I have to look at the uh, the lab schedule. But 49 wants you to calculate the molar mass of an acid based on the titration data. So we need to do that one, number 49. All right, so with 49, we're after the molar mass of an acid, so we need um, mass per moles. Okay, so we got to find both. We need the mass of the acid, and how many moles does that represent? So let's look at the information, 49. Oh, there's the mass of the sample of the acid. This is the pure acid, 0 0.580 grams. We got the mass. Now we need the moles. We're given information here. The acid is diprotic. So our acid is going to be this like that, and whatever else it has attached to it. It's got two protons that are neutralized by the sodium hydroxide. Right. So these two, that means you need two of these, and that makes two OHs and two hydrogens means two waters, plus two sodiums, excuse me, two sodiums plus the acidic part, the uh, ion that's left behind when the protons dissociate. Okay. That's important. That's very important to getting the right ratio of moles <clears throat> because we need to know the moles of this, but we only know how many moles of this it takes. All right, now for this reaction, we used 44.39 milliliters. Since we're gonna need moles, we're not gonna use millimoles. We're gonna actually change that to liters so we can get moles. So this would be 0 0.04439 liters. All right, three places, one, one, two, three. And the concentration of the acid is, of the base is 0 0.111 molar. Okay, so now we can calculate how many moles of base were used. 0 0.04439 and 0 0.111. So 4.927 times 10 to the minus third. moles of sodium hydroxide. How many moles of base uh, acid does that represent? Well, the ratio is two to one. So for every two sodium hydroxide, we have one acid. Oh, excuse me. So that means half of this is the number of moles of acid. 2.464 times 10 to the minus three. And then the mass is 
Uh, let's see, I didn't write that up there, did I? 0 0.580. This is moles. So now I just need to divide this number into 0.58. And I get 235. grams per mole. And that's uh, B. All right. So that's the type of calculation that you'll be doing in the um, uh, molar mass by acid by uh, titration. Only in and the, the one in the lab exercise, the uh, acid is triprotic. Right? Citric acid has three protons. So it's three here. Uh, it's the three here and three there. So this would be three divided into that value instead. All right. Let's see. Are we moving along? And yeah, we're getting there slowly. Okay, oxidation states. Let's figure oxidation states. Remember the rules. Right? Rules. All ground state atoms or normal elements at room temperature and pressure and one atmosphere pressure have an oxidation state of zero. All ions have an oxidation state equal to their charge. Um, some have a fixed amount that we assign to them. The halogens, uh, fluorine in particular, has minus one oxidation state. The others can vary, uh, but if, if, if we have to make a choice, then the halogens are minus one. Oxygen generally is minus two, unless it's in a peroxide, where two oxygens are bound together. Normally, oxygen has an oxidation state of that, but if you have two of them together, then both of those together are two minus, and each one is one minus. Um, the, there are fixed oxidation states for some of the metals. Right? The first group, alkali metals are plus one. Second group, plus two. Uh, boron, aluminum, gallium, indium in the third group of the representative elements uh, is plus three. And the rest are variable. You have to calculate those. So let's do some of that. Uh, let's go down to 52, was it? I think. Yeah, 52. Here we go. 52. In which one of these does the nitrogen have an oxidation state of plus four? So nitrogen is one of those where you do have to calculate the oxidation state. And remember, um, oxidation state isn't necessarily a charge. Now, if it's a free ion with a fixed charge, yeah, that's, that's the oxidation state and the charge. But the oxidation state in general is used as a bookkeeping device for where are the electrons going. And it works reasonably well, especially for salts and some covalent compounds that are associated with salts. Uh, and in this case, uh, you can use oxidation state in many cases to determine if a transfer of electrons has occurred. That's its primary use. Okay, so we've got A, B, C, D, and E, right? 
Yep. So the first one is HNO3. Second one is NO2, which is a covalent compound. N2O is another covalent. Those are both nonmetals, right? NH4Cl and NaNO2. Okay, oxidation state of nitrogen. So uh, oxygen is usually two minus. Hydrogen is a one plus in most circumstances. So three times two minus is six minus, and a one plus leaves us with five minuses. So five minus has to be balanced by that one nitrogen, which means this nitrogen is, not that one, is five plus. How about this one? Two minus. So that's a total of four minuses that have to be balanced by the N because neutral compounds, all the oxidation states must equal zero. So four minus means this has to be four plus. There's one. There's your answer, actually. Let's keep going. Two minus here means. Uh, this has to be two plus total, but each one has to be one plus, right? Because there are two of them. This is a minus one. This is a plus one or plus four total, which means a plus three, these two combined. So that means this nitrogen has to be a minus three. This one is a two minus for oxygen, which is a four minus. This is the sodium one plus, which means you've got three minuses that have to be balanced by one nitrogen at three plus. So this is a three plus, this nitrogen's a three minus, this one's a one plus, this one's a four plus, and this one's a five plus. Nitrogen can have lots of different oxidation states. Okay. Oh, so the answer for 52 is B. All right. Uh, we talked about oxidation reduction reactions before, so I'm not going to do 60. Let's see what else we got to play with. Uh, definitions on page 32. You can do those yourself. Balancing equations. This could use some work. Let me see. Yeah, these last two, 77 and 78, we'll do those two and see if we can balance these equations. <clears throat> All right, so 77 starts off with this compound. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is a fun one. Um, let's see. I better start over here. So we have C. Three, C three, H five, and then N O three taken three times, and that yields N two C O two water and oxygen. Anybody recognize that one? That's otherwise known as nitroglycerin. Very unstable compound. Uh, let me let me get down there to it. Sorry. 72. 
Yeah, uh, no, 77, excuse me. There we go. So there's the balanced equation, but I'm gonna show you how to get it, because right, this is the key. The answer's there. Nitroglycerin, when it decomposes, uh, it makes a big bang. It's very unstable, very sensitive to shock or heat. So if you ever run across a stick of, or a box of dynamite, which is basically nitroglycerin uh, evenly distributed in a uh, diatomaceous earth called Kizagur, uh, which helps stabilize it. But if those sticks of dynamite ever start to sweat, that sweat is not water, that's liquid nitroglycerin, which is coming out of the mixture. And that makes them very unstable. So if you see something like that, uh, go the other direction fast and get professional help. Okay, so when this nitroglycerin decomposes, it makes these gases. Nitrogen gas, carbon dioxide. Uh, there's a lot of heat, so water's a gas too, and oxygen. Okay, so let's balance it. All right, what do we have? We have carbon, we have hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. On this side, we have three, five, three nitrogens, right, because of that parenthesis, that uh, subscript, and nine oxygens. On this side, we have two nitrogens, uh, excuse me, two carbons, two carbons, hydrogens. Uh, two hydrogens, nitrogen, two, and oxygens, two, three, four, five. Okay, let's see if I got all of them. Uh, eight, 17, 20. Three, eight, 12 is 20. So we got two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Two, four, six. Oop, wait a minute, did I miss one? Two nitrogens, two hydrogens. Wait a minute, uh, two uh, carbon, one carbon, sorry. One carbon. See, sometimes it helps to count. So now we're good. <clears throat> All right. So remember one of those tricks, those little uh, helpful hints. If you've got any standalone elements, leave them to last. Well, in this one, we got two, right? So we can choose whichever one we want to uh, let wait till the last. And we'll do, uh, since oxygen occurs in both places, then we probably want to save oxygen till last. Definitely. So how about carbons, All right? We need three carbons. So we got three here, which means that we're going to change the number of oxygens. So six, seven, eight, nine oxygens. <coughs> How about hydrogens? We got two hydrogens over here. We got five hydrogens here. Let's leave, uh, now we're gonna have to do hydrogens. Okay, so if we got five hydrogens here and we need five over here, right, that's two. I'm trying, I'm thinking if I need to use that fraction trick. Might be too early to do that. No, let's do it. Five halves gives us five hydrogens. But it also gives us um, five halves oxygens. Ah, that's going to mess us up. Let's not do that.
Let's see what else we can do. How about nitrogens? Well, that won't help either. Okay. Uh, maybe I started at the wrong end. That makes sense. Three carbons gives us six, seven, eight, nine oxygen. Three carbons. So now we need hydrogen nitrogen balance. All right. So what we need to do is since we've got five hydrogens there and two here, cross multiplication is a possibility. So if we say, five times this one and two times this one. That gives us 10 hydrogens and 10 hydrogens. But it also gives us six carbons and two times three is six nitrogens. And two times nine is 18 oxygens. Right. And on this side, what we've done is we've changed five oxygens, five, six, seven, and seven and six is 13 oxygens. Okay. All right, so now what we're going to have to do, let's balance the carbons again. All right, we got six carbons here. We need six over here, and carbons only occurred in this place. So we'll change this to six, and that makes six carbons here, plus two times six is 12, and five is 12 and five is 17, 18, 19 oxygens. Okay, let's count those again. Let's see if we, let's do the whole thing count. Six carbons, yes. Hydrogens, 10 hydrogens, yes. Nitrogens, three times two is six, yes. Oxygens, nine times two is 18. That's good. Nitrogens on this side are two, six carbons, 12, 13, 14, and 5 is 19, yes, and nitrogens are 2. Okay, so that's, that's right. What we need to do now is even out these oxygens. So what we need is actually one less oxygen than we had. Right? One less oxygen means a half. So we take half of that oxygen, we have 18. Now the oxygens are fixed. Now we need to fix the nitrogens. So in order to get the right number of nitrogens, we need, there are no nitrogens here, so we need six nitrogens. There we go. So that's 6, 10, 6, 18. That's balanced, but it's not the simplest whole number ratio. So we got to get rid of the fraction right here. So that means we've got about to multiply the whole thing by 2. So now this one becomes 4. This one becomes 6. This one becomes 12, 10. And that one's gone, 1. So it should be uh, 4, 6, 12, 10, and 1. 4, 6, 12, 10, and 1. All right. Now it's balanced. This is why 
nitroglycerin is so explosive is not just the heat that's produced, which is considerable, but it's the overpressure. If you start off with four moles of a liquid and you convert it into six, 18, 28, 29 moles of gas, that's a huge expansion. And that overpressure is what gives you the explosive force of nitroglycerin. Right. That took a lot of work, you know, no doubt about it. All right, let's see what uh, <clears throat> 78 is all about. All right, this is going to give us a fit also. Why do I say that? Well, because there's a nitrate here, there's a nitrate there, but there's also a nitrogen here alone. So we cannot keep the nitrate as a separate entity because it, it's partially broken apart. Right? So we have to write the elements individually and balance them individually. Okay. Let's see. We're going to use redox to balance this equation. Now, why do I say that? Because here's iodine. It's uh, minus one redox, right? Because it's an ion. But here's the iodine. That's a zero because it's an element. So we have this iodine has lost, for each iodine, lost one electron in the process of transfer in the reaction to elemental iodine. So we have a redox reaction. We can use that to our advantage because if we balance the electrons first, then the rest of the equation becomes much simpler to balance. And I'm going to show you how that works in just a second. All right, 78. Okay, we've got uh, Ki. Uh, let's write it like this. Ki plus HNO3 yield KNO3 plus NO plus I2 plus H2O. Now what we have to do is figure out, since we know it's a redox reaction, electrons have been transferred from uh, one entity to another. In other words, you have a, a, an oxidation step that's accompanied with a reduction step. So we need to find out which one's which. Well, if this one's zero and this one, uh, excuse me, that one's minus one and this one is zero, we know that there was a loss of electrons here. From here to here, we had a loss of one electron per iodine. Okay? So if there's a loss, then somebody's got a gain. There had to be a gain of electrons somewhere. <coughs> Potassium's a plus one. This is plus one. It wasn't potassium. Hydrogen is a plus. That hydrogen is a plus. That's not it. Uh, this nitrogen is here and here, but it's also there. So nitrogen looks like a candidate. So what's the oxidation state for this nitrogen? Well, let's see, that's a minus. 
two minus six for those oxygens. Then a plus one means minus five. That means this is a five plus oxidation state. This is a two minus, so this is a two plus oxidation state. All right, so there it is. This plus five has gone to this two plus by gaining three electrons per nitrogen. Right? You gain three nickels to a five plus, that leaves you with two pluses. Right? It's just simple balance of charges. Okay, now we need to balance electrons. Right? So if we've got three here, but we still have to maintain that at two. So what we're starting out with here is two of these to equal two electrons lost. Right. So that balances that. Now we've got a three here and a two there. So we need to multiply these two by three and these by two. So if we say three here and that makes six here, right? Because it's three times two. Then that means we have six electrons transferred. Now we need six electrons here. So we need two of these and two of those. Two nitrogens, two nitrogens yields six electrons. Now that's our new starting point for balancing the equation. We've done the redox part. Now we can finish the molecular part, the atomic balance. So let's change this. We're starting off here with six, two there, one, two, three, and one. So let's move this out of the way so we can get to all the other information we need, like that. We can leave that stuff up there, it won't be in the way. Now we're gonna do our budget, potassium, iodine, protons, nitrogen, and oxygen. Okay, we've got six potassiums on this side, six iodines, two hydrogens, two nitrogens, right? Two times one is two. And six oxygens. On this side, we have potassiums one, we have iodines, six. We have hydrogens, two. That's it. We have nitrogens, two, three. And we have oxygens, three. Oh, my mistake. Two nitrogens plus one is three. And then oxygens. Less well, hydrogen, excuse me. What am I thinking? Two hydrogens. Nitrogens. Two, three. I had it right the first time. Oxygens. Three, four, five, six. So let's let's be sure that I didn't make a mistake. So we have six and twelve. 13, 14, 15, 16, 22. 22 total. Um, six, four, 10, and 12 is 22. Check. On this side, we have seven, eight, nine, 12, 18. So we have 18 up here. One, two, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, 15. 16, 17, 18. Okay, the first count is good. Now we need to balance the equation the rest of the way. So we do have um, this iodine sitting by itself. So we can leave that one till last. Oh, we try to leave water next to the last if we can. So let's focus in on Nitrogens, 
we've got nitrogen here, two of them, but here we've got them in two different places. So if we were to say, um, well, let's do potassium, right? Let's just make it simple. If there's six of them here, we need six potassium on this side. Okay. So that's six. Now that's six nitrogens and two nitrogens is eight nitrogens. Okay. And 18, 20, 21 oxygen. All right. Iodines are still good. Hydrogens. Hydrogens are still good. Nitrogens. We need eight nitrogens over here. All right. Let's see what that does. If we need eight nitrogens here, like that, then that makes also eight hydrogens. And three times eight is 24 oxygens. Okay, so these are good, these are good. Hydrogens, if we need eight hydrogens over here, that's four. So that's eight hydrogens and four oxygens plus five, six, plus 18 is 24. Okay. Oh, got lucky. We're balanced. Six, eight, six, two, three, four. Six, eight, six, two, three, four. We're balanced. And you know you can't simplify it any further because even though you've got all these evens in here, there's one odd. That one can't be reduced any further. So you're stuck. That's it. You're done. So that was the redox trick. If you, if you see um, redox potential in an unbalanced equation, do the electrons first. Because after you do the electrons, then uh, balancing the atoms won't affect that value. And you can check yourself. You just go in and say, all right, if we got, um, if this is going from one to zero, and you got six of them, then you need six electrons. We're good there. And if you're going from well, I erased it from, I think it's plus five to plus two. So there's uh, three electrons transferred per nitrogen. So three times eight is 24, right? No, I can't be right. It's balanced. I'm, I'm still curious. I want to find out. So if this is balanced, the number of electrons should also be balanced. Six electrons transferred. We should have six electrons transferred here. Oh, oh, I got it. All of these nitrogens are not reduced. All of them are not gaining electrons, only the ones that contribute to these two. So if there, there are only three electrons per nitrogen and there are two here, then that's six electrons. The other six nitrogens are over here. I'm happy now. <laughs> okay, um, that's it. I don't have anything else to uh, contribute for this review, all you can do now is study and work lots of problems. Okay, Let's see that needs to stay here. And I'm gonna call it quits.
and um, post a video as soon as possible. So we're, we're way over. Uh, I've got one student left. Do you have any uh, comments or questions? Um, I do have a question actually about the homework for chapter three. There's one problem that I cannot seem to figure out. Um, oh, okay. Um, have you tried to contact me through the homework? Uh, I have no idea how to do that. Oh, uh, it should be um, um, at the, the bottom of each homework problem. There should be contact your uh, instructor. When you do it that way, since my email is in Cengage, so they'll send me a notice with a link to the problem that you're working on. So when I click that link, I'll go straight to your problem. And then oh, okay. I'm, I'm looking at the right one. But since we're here, um, if you remember the particulars, maybe I can help you with it before without having to go back. Um, yeah, I have it pulled up. It's oh, okay. Hold on. Let me stop the share okay. and let you share your screen. Okay. Okay. A compound contains carbon hydrogen nitrogen. Combustion of 35 milligrams of the compound produces 53 CO2, 32 water. What's the empirical formula of the compound? Okay, we didn't do a problem like that, did we? All right. So let me see, what do we have? Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen only. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen. And uh, we have a 35 milligram sample of the compound. So with a total mass of 35 milligrams, total mass, I better write that mass. Total mass of 35 milligrams, uh, combusted, which means oxygen is available, right? So oxygen here uh, comes from the atmosphere. What we want to get at is how much carbon does that 53 milligram represent? So it produces 53 milligrams of carbon dioxide and 32.6 milligrams, 32.6 milligrams of water. Okay, so in order to do the empirical formula calculation, we need to know the absolute mass in that compound of each of these. With this one, we can get carbon. With that one, we can get hydrogen. And by difference, wait a minute, nitrogen? Yeah, by difference, we can get nitrogen, right? If we know carbon, hydrogen, and the total, subtract them from the total and you get nitrogen. Okay, so that's, that's the approach. So how do, you, how do you tease out the actual mass in each one of these? Well, you need a percent composition of CO2 and water. Right? How much of that 53 milligrams is actually carbon? And you do that by 12.01 uh, is the molar mass of carbon, and 12.01 is in the total, plus 2 times 16 is 32. Right? So the fraction of carbon out of that sample Rather than doing percent, let's just do fraction. Because if you do percent, then you got to work your way back to fraction anyway. So 12.01 and 32 right, is uh, 0 0.2729. 0.2729. Is the fraction of carbon. So out of this much times that is the carbon. So we take this one times that one and that equals to 53, 14.46 uh, milligrams. 
is carbon. Do the same thing for water to find out what hydrogen is. So the hydrogen composition here would be um, 2.02, right, for two hydrogens. And then you have to put it in the hole, right? Just because we put it up here doesn't mean it's not still down there, plus oxygen. And see what that fraction is. 2.02 and 16. Let me see if I did that right, 2.02. Yeah, it is 0 0.1121, 0 0.1121. Right, so this times that is equal to what? Uh, 3.654, 3.654 milligrams of uh, hydrogen. Okay, so that's carbon, that's hydrogen, and what's left over is nitrogen. So we minus 14.46 and minus 3.654. Fourteen point four six. Okay, so that's eighteen point one one subtracted from thirty five is sixteen point eight nine. So we have nitrogen is sixteen point eight nine milligrams, and um, hydrogen is 3.654 milligrams and carbon is 14.46 there we go so now we've got something we can work with to determine uh empirical formula so that was really the the hard part probably figuring out how to tease out the information from that given. All right, so we can convert this you know it might be simpler to con to um, use grams and still milligrams. This ratio for this compound is fixed. Right, so if this were grams, it'd still be the same ratio. So instead of this, we could say 14.46 grams, 3.64 grams, six, five, four, excuse me, five, four, and 16.89 grams. Now we can use Henry Ford's help. Okay, whoops, nitrogen is 14.01. And you see why I wanted to convert to grams. I just wanted to be sure it was kosher, right? Same ratio, right? Just multiply this times a thousand, times a thousand, times a thousand. You get that, that, and that. And hydrogen is 1.01 .01, and carbon is 12.01. So now it's a, Number crunching game. This is 1.204. And this is 3.654. 1.01 divided into that. 3.62. And 1.8. Okay. And 16.89. 14.01. Is 1.206. Okay. Now we need to get whole numbers. So we can divide this one since it's the smallest one. All right. 
this is going to be approximately one. This is going to be exactly one. And 3.618 divided by 1.204 is three. So now the empirical formula would be uh, carbon one, hydrogen three, and nitrogen one. Whoops. You lose the share. Did he did it uh, accept the answer? Hold on. Okay. And there we go. I had to switch all my tabs. Okay. And there you go. Yeah. Awesome. I just, I couldn't figure out how to get to, or I couldn't figure out, because I knew how to find the empirical formula, but I couldn't figure out how to get from the milligrams of each to the ratio. <laughs> right. And I'm like, I don't think I'm using stoichiometry right in this particular yeah, <laughs> problem. If, if I had more time, then we could go through an actual, I mean, this is what they do in the lab to determine the composition of these organic compounds is it's it's called a, a combustion chain and they'll take the sample and uh, add oxygen at high temperature through the furnace and it'll combust the sample and then they'll have a, a series of absorbers on the other end one of them absorbs carbon dioxide and the other one absorbs water and the difference in mass they determine as the amount of the absorbed water or the absorbed carbon dioxide. And that's where those milligrams come from. So then this is what they do with the data. Of course, if you do it day in and day out, you just set it up in a spreadsheet, right? And then you just plug in the numbers and bam, ca calculates everything for you.